Hey guys, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. So for those of you who don't know, about a year ago, I had my breast implants removed and I went all natural and I couldn't be happier. I am completely healed, recovered. I'm very excited to share with you that it was one of the best decisions that I ever made and I'm very, very happy. A bunch of news outlets covered my surgery, but none of them asked me for a quote or to talk about it. And I just kind of felt like everyone was talking about about the surgery that I had had except for me and I just really thought I should share my perspective and thoughts on it and I could answer some of your guys' questions. So let's go back to the beginning to answer some of your questions. A lot of you were asking how I felt about plastic surgery and honestly, I have nothing against cosmetic procedures. I truly believe that if you are healthy mentally and physically, to each their own. I'm not very judgmental when it comes to those things. Now just to be clear, when I had augmentation done 13 years ago, nothing went wrong. I had a safe procedure and we had a great 13 years together. I had fun, no complaints, but had I known that implants were not lifetime devices, you really do need to replace them every 10 to 15 years. Everybody's a little bit different. I'm not so sure that I would have made those decisions looking back because right now, I'm healthy enough to have a surgery, but in 15 years from now or 30 years from now, I'm not so sure that I wanna keep going under the knife every 15 years. Being all natural is just one less thing to think about and it was the right decision for me for my life moving forward. Another question that I got asked is, if I had augmentation because I was on camera more and I was thinking about my image and the answer is no. Quite the opposite, actually. I had breast augmentation surgery before I had started YouTube. I never thought I would be on camera. I actually, at this time, I was a teacher. I had no intention of being on camera. The more time I spent on camera, the more I was feeling like I wanted to be more natural. So fast forward to last year. It was that time where I had to make a decision. It was either time to replace them or do something different. Maybe go all natural. And that is what I was leaning towards. I was just nervous because I didn't know what would happen. So I did a lot of research. I got an amazing referral from my friend who is also a physician to work with the surgeon that I did, Dr. Robert Cohen. And I went to go see him to get a consultation and he blew my mind. I let him know I wanted to remove my implants and he let me know there was another option available if I wanted to go all natural. It was called fat grafting and it was the perfect fit for me. So Dr. Cohen is almost here. I can't wait for you to meet him. So here I am with Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen, big thank you for taking the time today to come talk with me. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So Dr. Cohen, would you introduce yourself to everyone? Name, yep. what you do, all that kind of stuff. So my name is Robert Cohen. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. I specialize in aesthetic surgery of the breast and body. I've been practiced for about 16 years or so. I have practice in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hills Center. I also have a practice that I had built up for many years in Scottsdale, Arizona as well. So that's, uh, that's what I do. I do pretty much anything with the breast and body that's uh, aesthetic in nature. I have a lot of book chapters written on this stuff and I do uh, speaking on these topics all over the world on this because it's really a passion of mine. If anyone watching today wanted to check you out or find you, where can we find you? So probably the most uh, information would be on my website, which mm -hmm. is drrobertcohen.com. Okay. So D-R-R-O-B-E-R-T-C-O-H-E-N.com. Your name. Exactly. And then my Instagram has a lot of information too, <laughs> and that's just Robert Cohen MD. I'm gonna be putting all those links in the description, so if you wanna go check it out, you can. I've Sounds got good. questions. Yes. So a question that I got a lot from my friends mm -hmm. and my family was, what procedure did I have done? Yeah. And when I tried to explain it, mm -hmm. they still look confused. Right. I got a lot of questions from you all, like you asked me to make a video to clarify, and I thought, I need help. For lack of better knowledge, I was telling friends that we took fat from my leg and put it on my chest <laughs> and they went what that's oh. a thing what you can do that and i said yes it's called fat grafting right. what is mm -hmm. fat grafting yep and how do you do it so it sounds a little bit like science fiction you know we're taking fat from one part of the body and moving it somewhere else yes so so basically what happened is when you came to see me you were interested in a breast revision surgery and you mm -hmm. had prior saline breast implants yes and when you came in you thought maybe you needed a lift and new implants and then when I saw you, I was looking at what your goals were and your anatomy, and to me, it made sense that you didn't really need implants anymore because you had 
tissue, soft tissue of your own, natural tissue, meaning fat, oh, that I could I transfer to the breast to get the, the look that you wanted. <laughs> what I find is a lot of patients going into surgeons, if the surgeon doesn't really have a full array of techniques, they're just gonna get the same thing offered every time, like implant, 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 One implant. One option. Right. And, right, and you know, implants are wonderful when you need them. For people who don't have enough natural tissue and they want volume or you need to reshape the breast, an implant can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you already have enough of your own natural tissue, I'd prefer to do an all-natural breast surgery so that you don't have the, the the maintenance of implants over time. So basically you have fat cells throughout your body obviously mm -hmm. and then some areas are more diet resistant than others. So diet resistant fat tends to be like uh, in, in men it's usually the stomach and love handles. Oh, okay. Women it tends to be maybe more love handles and thighs and yeah, it's just thighs. an area where it's the last area of, of fat to go when you lose weight. So those are the best fat cells because they're the ones that kind of oh. uh, stay stable the longest. So generally when I'm doing fat grafting what I'm, I'm doing is I'm looking at areas of the body where somebody has more fat than they want aesthetically speaking and mm -hmm. it's good quality fat, you do liposuction to remove fat from those areas, mm -hmm. um, then the fat's processed and purified. I use a system called PureGraph where the fat goes from your body through uh, the cannula, which is the metal tube that you do liposuction, through tubing into a filter, and inside the filter I can wash the fat and then draw the fat back up after I get rid of all the oils and impurities and things you don't want, and then I re-inject it back into wherever I want the fat to go. So the fat's never exposed to the environment, it's mm -hmm. a very clean, sterile system. And so you're borrowing fat from areas where you don't need the fat, and then after you process it, you plug it back into a new area. Now, what you're not doing is in injecting big blobs of fat. Each thin thread of fat is basically just a little bit of fat cells that's mixed in with the rest of the tissue, and the mm. blood supply in the surrounding tissue keeps those fat cells alive. One thing I always tell patients when we're talking about fat grafting is it's not as predictable as an implant in the sense that, like, let's say somebody wants to be 300 cc's bigger, you can open up an implant that's 300 cc's, put it in, you have 300 cc's. With fat grafting, right. we don't know exactly how much fat we're gonna get out when we do the surgery. Of the fat that comes out, not all of that fat is, is good enough to put back in after it's processed and purified. Mm -hmm. And then of the fat that goes back into the new area, not all of it will stay permanently. So usually right. about 60% of what's injected will stay and 40% will reabsorb, sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on the patient's genetics and a bunch of other factors. Literally almost 100% of the time, if I have people come in with like a spouse or whatever, mm -hmm. usually the spouse will say, I, I'll donate, you know, as a joke. But yes. um, you can't get fat from somebody else because it's not your genetics, so you would reject it. But if it's your own fat, you can take it from one area of body and stick it in another area, that's totally fine. So you can't be a fat donor, unfortunately, uh, even though we get that offer all the time. You guys, I can't tell you how fascinated I am by this technique. 14 years ago, when I did augmentation, I didn't know that this even existed. It was much less common 14 years ago. Yeah. So that that was sort of like a, it was more of an emerging technology and mm -hmm. technique. Nowadays, I think if you're not doing fat grafting, you're depriving patients of a really important tool. So like when I talk to patients about fat grafting versus implants, I always say, you know, the pros and cons, and you have to weigh out both. So with mm -hmm. the implants, you have predictability. You don't need any alternative surgery sites because you're not harvesting anything. Mm -hmm. So that's the upside is that, you know, you know how much volume you have and you can just open a box and the volume is there. You don't have to take it from other parts of the body. Right. The downside is implants have more maintenance involved. You have to switch them out periodically during your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And there's certain complications that can happen with implants that you wouldn't get without an implant, like capsular contracture where you get scar hardening. Mm -hmm. With the fat grafting, you know, the pros are that it's all natural, so there's Love not all the maintenance. Um, and then the, the fact that you have to take it from other body areas is both a pro and a con, because you have some soreness um, yeah. from liposuction, but usually people are happier with where they how they look in the areas where you take the fat from. So it's kind of like a double bonus. And then right. you're taking fat from where you don't want it, sticking where you do want it, that's kind of a win-win. So that's the main advantage of fat grafting, is the natural element of it, and the fact that you get improvements from the liposuction. Because I remember after years, I wanted to do some Thing, but I didn't know what and I didn't know if that would be just removing my implants having nothing I was just so excited that there was a different option that felt like it was for me as yeah. I said before when you need implants they're great patients who have implants tend to really love them for the most part mm -hmm. but when people are over it or they don't need them why use a foreign body when you can use natural tissue that's sort of my my way of thinking about yeah. things my implants were wonderful for yeah. 13 years. I loved them, had a great time, but I was thinking about the future, kind of yeah. like we were talking about. Right now I'm healthy enough to have surgery, but what about in 10 years or 20 years? You know, I don't know where I'm gonna be, and 
I know that implants are lifetime devices. Correct. We've got to do some updating. So I was like, I really want to just find something that works for me. Absolutely. And for deflating my implants, we actually have some footage of it. Dr. Cohen, could mm -hmm. you walk us through the process? Because yeah. I didn't have to go under for this. No, I, that's a very I, easy I didn't, procedure. I, you guys, I barely felt it. It's barely a procedure. It's mm -hmm. like the probably one of the most minor things I can possibly do. It was easy. Exactly. So for patients with saline implants, basically what we're doing is we're just taking like a small IV, like you'd get, you know, if you had IV fluid, mm -hmm. but I'm, instead of putting it in a vein, I'm basically just poking it into the implant itself. Just the side of me. Yeah, Oof. and it's usually not not a lot of depth to get to the implant. Then I connect, feel I connect the IV <laughs> essentially to a tubing to suction mm -hmm. and just suck all the saline out of the implant. It usually just takes a few minutes. And mm -hmm. so what that does is it allows me to drain the implant. Obviously the implant shell is still in there. That has to be removed with the real surgery, but this gets all the volume out so that the breast shrinks down. Mm -hmm. um, it tells me exactly how much saline you had. So for patients who don't remember how much volume they had, it, I, I know. It's like a five minute procedure. You can go exercise later that day if you want to. Mm -hmm. It's really a nothing procedure. All right, so we just finished the deflation. As you saw, she did great. It really wasn't painful at all. I mean, it's almost zero pain. Um, and so really good news for her. So basically there's a little bit of a scoop out in the breast where we've lost that immediate volume. But the, the, what happens over time is the skin is gonna to start to shrink and contract. There's really no true drooping, I meaning there's no overhanging of skin. There's Woo! nothing else to do that. Yes. <laughs> yes, because I honestly so, in my head I thought they would be down to my knees. Yeah. And that was not the case. Thankfully physics is not working. Out. <laughs> uh, at least not in your case. <laughs> so so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna give it a few weeks and as each week goes by the skin tends to shrink and tighten up more and more. Mm -hmm. Not that she needs a liposuction, but that's the way that we can get the fat to add back in here. So we borrow the fat from areas where she doesn't want it, mm -hmm. put it back in the area where she does want it, and we're gonna fill out that little bit of a scooped out area with some fat to do the volume so and cool. give the roundness and some perkiness. I'm, I'm really hopeful based on how you're looking right now. Okay. You don't need to put new implants back in. I think you're good. <gasps> Just take the shells out. Oh my gosh, this would be so excited. Yeah, so it'll be, it'll be all natural. Oh my gosh. And everything went perfectly, so I'm really happy with how things are looking so far, and I'll be super excited to see you in a few weeks, and we'll make some final decisions at that point. Cool. For patients with silicone implants, it's just a little bit trickier because you can't deflate silicone. Right. So for those patients, what I do is I just bring them to the operating room, but they don't have to go to sleep. I just do a little bit of numbing medication in the bottom of the breast, mm -hmm. and a lot of times I'll use laughing gas, which kind of makes them relax, just like <laughs> at the dentist. I've and used then, it at the dentist. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> and then I, I just make a small incision, and I'm able to just pull the implants out really quickly. Oh, cool. um, people think, like when they hear it, they're like, oh my God, this sounds freaky, but when they actually go through it, it's really no big deal. Mm -hmm. It's usually like you know a very short procedure. They can pretty much it's virtually no recovery from that. And then the same thing, you wait usually about six weeks, let the skin shrink, and then when you do the final See surgery, you do, looking, do the real surgery. Then, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if anyone's curious of what it felt like for the six weeks before surgery, because I still have the, I call it a bag, but that's not right. What the you, shell, the, you the usually shell call the implant, the implant shell, yeah. Still in there, I only felt it, honestly, for a few days. That's how it is, so. You just feel it a little bit, but I will say, not painful, yeah. it didn't hurt, it just, I could feel a little bit, but then my my body really adapted? Exactly. So 99% of the patients when I do deflation do just fine. They may have a little bit of irritation because where the used to be a round implant, now it's a flattened shell mm -hmm. and the edge of it sometimes can be a little, just kind of poke or feel a little funny for a day or two. Mm -hmm. And then everything kind of shifts and goes back to normal again. It did. And then I have like, I've had like a couple patients in the past where it was just annoying enough mm -hmm. that I just did kind of what I do with the silicone. I put a little numbing medication and just pull the, sal the saline shells out um, because it was bothering them. That's yeah. super uncommon uh, and very, very easy to do. I was nervous when we def deflated mm -hmm. the implant. Okay. I was scared that my like. boobs were going to just sag down to my mm -hmm. belly button. I didn't know what to expect. I was like, there's going to be all the skin. And I was really surprised that the breasts were like still up here. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it just had that loss of volume. volume. The skin really tightened and and like kind of bounced it back, back nicely for you. More than I thought. Yep. I thought we were going to have to do a full lift. Right. That's the other thing about the deflation is you may not know exactly which type of lift you need and you might need a bigger lift immediately like day after deflation. That's right. But you wait a few weeks and it shrinks up, you might not need as big of a lift. Mm -hmm. Or even if you do still need the same degree of lift, the lift is going to be more successful for you. Now, Dr. Cohen, I was under when this fat grafting process right. was going on. So could you just walk me through what you did? Sure. 
So um, basically for the surgery, obviously you were fully asleep. And yes. What, so <laughs> I, I do want to talk about this because one thing that patients worry about probably more than almost anything is the anesthesia. And they mm. always say, am I going to wake up during surgery? Am I not going to wake up at the end of surgery? So what people have to understand is that, you know, w with my surgeries, I'm always using a board certified MD anesthesiologist. So they're going to be top level of training. And I we handpick the best of the best anesthesiologists. So we have amazing people. So the anesthesia is, is extremely safe. Um, I always tell patients, statistically speaking, the most dangerous thing you do in the day of surgery is drive to the office for your surgery. So with the anesthesia, um, you are not paralyzed for the surgery, so you're breathing on your own, but mm -hmm. you're, you're deep enough under anesthesia, you're totally unaware of what's going on. We don't have to worry about you waking up and not being able to, to know because if you even slightly start getting lighter under anesthesia, we'll see your blood pressure go up or you'll kind of shift a tiny bit way before your brain is aware of what's going on, the anesthesiologist can deepen you up. At the end of surgery, when surgery's over, it's the medications are keeping you asleep. So as soon as they start turning off those medications, your body will naturally wake up. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we have to bring it back from the great beyond. It's basically you're automatically waking up unless they keep you suppressed with the medications. Ah, so I think that's important stuff to know from the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So once you were asleep, mm -hmm. first thing I did was I removed the old implant shells mm -hmm. um, through a small incision in the bottom of the breast. And then I also washed the pockets out with a special product called hypochlorous acid, uh, which it kills bacterial biofilms. So if there's any kind of bacterial contamination at all in there, which I didn't think there was, but just to be extra safe, we get things really nice and clean. Then after I took your implants out because your capsules, which is the scar tissue around your implants, mm -hmm. were totally normal, oh, tissue good. paper thin, yes. there was no need to remove the capsule. So mm -hmm. if you go online, you kind of see a lot of information like, oh, you always have to take the capsule out. Not true. Capsules are just your normal scar tissue you form around the implant. Mm -hmm. Now in certain situations, if it gets calcified or really thick or abnormal, or somebody has textured implants where they're worried about certain issues, uh, there's a very rare type of cancer that can be uh, associated with textured implants. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain situations where, yes, it's appropriate to take the capsule out. But if the capsule is super, super thin, all taking the capsule out does is it creates more um, soreness, more chance for bleeding, and also having the skin here and the capsule there with the tissue in between, that gives us a, a sandwiching effect. So when I inject that fat grafting, it's kind of held in place. You don't have to worry about any of the fat kind of trickling into where the mm -hmm. implant used to be. Dr. Cohen, could you talk a little bit about recovery mm -hmm. and aftercare? Because I Absolutely. know when we did surgery, there's always uh, that time period that you need to fully recover. But then right. with fat grafting, there's something a little bit different. Right. We'll start with the recovery part. So okay. In general, liposuction is one of the little bit more sore surgeries because mm -hmm. it's it's blunt dissection. You're, you're basically using a tiny little incision and removing a lot of fat under the skin. So the good thing about liposuction is tiny scars. The part that's not as great is that there's you know some more trauma under the skin where you can feel sore for a while. So liposuction is usually kind of um, most of the soreness in the first like few days after surgery. Yeah. But there can be like a general achiness that can last for a number of weeks or even a little bit longer afterwards. It gets better slowly over time. And same thing with swelling. There can be swelling that slowly shrinks down. So you do the, the some compression, usually about mm -hmm. four to six weeks. Um, other stuff's really important is uh, you know getting up and walking after surgery mm -hmm. for circulation, doing deep breathing to get good oxygenation, eating a very healthy diet. So lots of protein is very important for healing. Good fruits and vegetables, a lot of you know like vitamin C, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, some of the additional things we do, like we did the red light bed, which helps yeah. to reduce inflammation. We did hyperbaric oxygen therapy, yes. so you get like extra oxygen, like kind of into the cells, which helps to heal and fight infection. So that was kind of all the early stuff, um, and then over time, uh, so one of the in a, and then as far as exercise, usually I want about a month um, after surgery, patients take it pretty easy, so they're not exercising too much because we don't want to um, stir up more swelling and inflammation, and also your body is using a lot of protein, and a lot of energy to heal, so we don't want to mm -hmm. divert that towards muscle building. Now, as far as the specific thing about fat grafting, you're talking about, so yes. during that <laughs> first six months while the fat's kind of taking, meaning mm -hmm. like we're waiting for the fat cells to fuse to the surrounding tissues and get blood supply, you will lose some fat during that time. Mm -hmm. We generally want patients to kind of maintain their weight uh, rather than trying to cut weight during that period of time so that the fat cells have the best environment to sort of mature and, and sort of solidify in their position. So I, I asked you to just try to keep your weight fairly even for about six months. Once the six month mark is there, whatever fat cells you have are pretty much what you have and those fat cells just shrink and grow with uh, breast uh, in the breast with weight gain and weight loss. What's good advice for anyone out there who's considering to do surgery of any kind? Right. Choosing a surgeon is really a big deal. If you're going to see somebody for a breast surgery, for example, a cosmetic breast surgery, mm -hmm. you want to make sure they're certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. There's a lot of other boards that try to sound fancier, like the American Academy of Cosmetic, this and that, but in reality, there's just one board that's proper training for plastic surgeons, which is the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Simple name, that's that's the baseline. Now, that's okay. not enough in my opinion, but that's the starting point. Now, you want to make sure that that surgeon that you're going to see has a ton of experience in the area that you want to do. So, so 
if it's somebody who does mostly facelifts, I don't know that they're the ones that should be doing a complicated breast surgery. Right. It doesn't mean that they can't, and there's certainly plenty of surgeons who do both face and body, but personally I find that people who subspecialize tend to get a, a kind of a higher level of results because you're kind of going deeper in that area as far as more techniques. So for me, I specialize in neck down. Uh, my partner here uh, specializes in neck up. Mm -hmm. And so we both focus on our areas and can kind of go deeper from that standpoint. That's a great team um, too. Yeah, it's really nice. Again, thank you Dr. Cohen for being here and taking the time to answer all these questions. I really me. appreciate it. It's always a pleasure hanging out with you in any way. And it's it's really fun. One of the things I do a lot of is uh, educating. So I, I do a lot of, um, written a lot of book chapters and journal entries and uh, speak a lot at meetings and that's for other plastic surgeons but mm -hmm. I also really enjoy educating patients because I think this is like uh, a good way to give back to the specialty and help people make safe decisions for themselves so if anybody has like specific questions you'd like to ask I can't answer so much like specific medical information for a given person without doing a consultation but for just right. general plastic surgery questions patients uh, if they want to um, ask a question they can just DM me uh, my Instagram is at Robert Cohen MD mm -hmm. and I do a lot of like posts where I answer or people's uh, questions about general things like what we we're talking about today and I really yeah. enjoy doing that. All right, that does it for the video. I know that this video is a little bit different. I don't usually make these kinds of videos, but I really hope that it helps someone out there. Someone found it informative and helpful. As time goes on, I'm learning a lot and I truly believe there shouldn't be stigmas talking about anything related to health, whether it's cosmetic, it's therapeutic, or it's treatments we're going under, like when my dad was going through a bunch of treatments for his cancer treatments. I really believe that the more that we talk about our medical experiences and health, the better we all are for it. We can learn so much from each other, from others' experiences. So in the future, I plan to talk about my future medical experiences, whatever they are, and I hope it encourages other people to do the same. I think stigma around talking about medical things, again, whether they're cosmetic, therapeutic, or life-saving, I don't think there should be a stigma. All right, thanks for watching. It was great talking with you guys, and I hope I answered a bunch more of your questions this time. Bye-bye.